I'm here to present uh, Mindcastle, which is a secure distributed block device for the edge in the cloud. Um, so you probably ask, what is Mindcastle? Um, there are some possible short ex shortish explanations. Uh, one is that it's a comp compressed, encrypted, self-certifying, cache-oblivious block device, or it's a serverless storage system, or it's a block store to optic store mapper, or you could also think of it as simply Git for your storage. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, why we are building Mindcastle and what we're using it for. Um, <coughs> Vertigo is uh, working on Edge AI. So we're building smart cameras like the one pictured on the right uh, that can be used for stuff like counting people in a room like this. So imagine if we came in this morning and the heating had already been, you know, would automatically come on just because there are people in the room. Um, <laughs> that would have been awesome, right? Uh, it also, we also use it for stuff like uh, face recognition and so on. Um, and so we actually have, uh, we're working with a hardware um, uh, maker who are actually shipping these uh, small cameras that are basically like a, a souped up uh, Raspberry Pi with a, with a camera and, and an ice box uh, outside. Um, so uh, why does that need a storage system? Well, if you're thinking about equipping a building like the size of this hotel with a, lots of uh, little tiny Linux machines, uh, it's not really a feasible strategy to keep them uh, updated with something like, you know, SSH access and, and app get update. Um, so what we think you want is kind of a uh, tamper-proof way of, of putting uh, the same container image uh, onto all these little devices. Um, and uh, it needs to be tamper-proof, uh, well, first and foremost, because uh, these devices have perhaps like cheap little SD cards that can corrupt. But it could also be that somebody actually wants to you know, peel this device from the wall and uh, install their own software on it that does you know, spying for some foreign government, or uh, maybe they just want to steal your software. So we want everything to be uh, hashed and encrypted. Um, so we're, what we are, part of what we're selling is this little Linux uh, build root distribution that has Mindcastle on top. And then we, have, we are just running uh, um, what's in the Mindcastle file system as a container. And then we let the customer put their stuff in there um, along with our neural network stuff. It also means that if the customer uh, makes a mistake, then they can't accidentally break all the devices in the building. Um, and so for, for our own use, we also use it for, um, we're training these deep neural networks and uh, we're kind of a small cash strapped uh, startup. So we don't want to spend a lot of money on, on uh, AWS. Um, so, the thing that's not going to work is just rent a lot of GPUs and then preload the machines with uh, our software and our data sets and then never turn them off again because that's, a, that's you know, quickly going to be more expensive than just buying the machines outright. Um, so instead, what we do is we, we put all our uh, code, all our data sets into a Mindcastle container and then we put that one onto S3. Of course, it still costs something to have it on S3, but it's, it's a lot cheaper to have it there than to have it on you know, N uh, GPU VMs uh, pre-allocated. And then we just use spot instances when we need to do the training. And also this uh, frees us from being tied to one provider. Say we could, we could have put this on uh, something like EBS, but then we couldn't reuse the same image on Google's cloud, but with Mindcastle we can. Uh, <clears throat> so this is actually, uh, so I think this is like the third talk about uh, LSM data structures for storage today. Uh, I think this is probably the oldest system. Um, I started working on this in 2011 uh, in a startup called Bromium. Uh, anyone here know Bromium? Yeah. So it, it was founded by the people who built the Zen hypervisor, basically. Um, and the idea was to use uh, virtual machines for uh, security isolation on uh, end user devices like Windows desktops. <coughs> and so what Bromium does is that it'll, it'll take you a Windows session and it'll explode it into NVMs. So if you have like 100 tabs open in your web browser, that's actually 100 different uh, Windows VMs each running just a single Internet Explorer. And it also works with stuff like Office, so you can have, you know, somebody sends you a, a Word document with a virus inside, then that goes into its own VM. And if there's a malware, then the malware will, will explode inside the VM and not uh, onto your system. And um, you can imagine that, that back in 2011, this was you know, quite a, a technical challenge to, to get flying. So say we want to run actually 100 VMs on our four gigabyte laptop with our hard drive. And, and each VM needs yeah, I think it's impossible to install Windows in less than 20 gigabytes. Uh, so it's 100 times 20 gigabytes that you need there. And then uh, if all the VMs are running, they, they, when they're running, they need at least something like uh, 100 IOPS from the disk drive. 
uh, for their swapping and so on, especially because we try to squeeze them on, on memory so they don't use so much memory. And if you only got 100 IOPS total from your little mechanical high drive there, then, then how do you uh, deliver that kind of oversubscription? Um, <clears throat> so first we thought, well, there are all these kind of cool uh, virtual machine storage formats like, for instance, VHD from Microsoft. Uh, but it turns out they don't really solve this problem. Um, they are kind of built like, I think most people here know how, how page tables work. So they are like page tables just with, with bigger page sizes. So basically what, ha what happens is initially the, the table is empty and then when you do a write, then you'll allocate, uh, say, two megabytes uh, in a page on disk and then all the future writes uh, will go there. And if you try to read from an empty page, you'll get zeros back and if you try to read from, from an allocated page, you'll get the contents of the page back. <coughs> so the problem with that is that it's just a level of indirection. It doesn't really remove any of the IOs. So if the, if the IOs is, is doing, if the VM is doing, doing 100 IOs, then it, it, it needs to, uh, the, the host needs to deliver 100 physical IOs. And uh, of course we know, especially back then on hard drives, uh, random IOs are, are really slow. And also something we've, we found in practice is if you do a lot of random writes from your VMs, then uh, at least back then your, your SSD would, would you know, basically die. So we had this, our IT guy had this stack of like 10 or 15, dead uh, SSDs uh, on this table because you know, we would wear them out in, in a few months of, of running Bromium. And, and finally, there's the problem of uh, space uh, blow up. So, so let's say I, uh, so we can't trust the workloads running in these VMs because they could be virus or malware, for instance. Uh, so it's very easy to write a little, little tool that will go and touch every page in this page table and, and you know, pre-allocate everything. And then you end up with you know, whatever, 20 gigabytes uh, for, for one VM. And then finally, we, we uh, did some measurement that, that uh, well, we found out about LZ4 basically. And LZ4, this, LZ4 is this insanely fast data compressor. And we wanted to do data compression so that we could, you know, every time the, the VM is writing a megabyte, then we could on average, you know, only have to write a half a megabyte uh, on the host. So none of the existing formats at the time could do that. So we, we thought about coming up with our own. <clears throat> and so I had, um, Actually, a little bit of experience writing uh, virtual disk backends because I'd been working at VMware for a number of years uh, on a project called uh, Lithium, uh, which was kind of the research prototype that, that turned into the VMware vSAN project, if anyone knows that. Um, and that was kind of a log structured uh, block device. So basically, every time the VM writes something, you'll just append it to the end of the log. And, and that actually works fairly great, especially if your goal is to do replication because locks are really easy to replicate uh, across hosts. Uh, and, and so the problem with anybody who's, who's worked with lock structuring will tell you is that uh, you know, once you build the lock structure, that was the easy part, and then you spend basically the rest of your career working on the garbage collector. So we didn't want to go back to having to build another garbage collector. So we <clears throat> thought about it some more, and it kind of occurred to us that really virtual disks are they're just like databases, right? They're, they're sort of simple key value stores where the keys are your uh, disk LBA offsets and the values are what, you know, whatever the contents of these sectors are. And so um, <clears throat> in the database there, the, the kind of traditional solution has always been to use a B tree um, for this kind of on-disk structure. Um, what's nice about a B tree is that, that uh, compared to something like a binary tree where you would have uh, you know, order of log n uh, disk IOs for every access, so if you have like you know, a million keys in your database, then that means you probably have, you know, on average, 20 IOs you have to do. And so a B-tree kind of compresses that by, by making the nodes wider, and you can make them really wide. So, so let's say you have 1,000 keys in each of your B-tree uh, nodes, then instead of having to do 20 IOs, you only have to do two IOs. And then typically, actually, the root node will be cached in memory, so you only have to do one IO. <clears throat> so that's great. So the, the problem with B-trees is that when you, when you start doing you know, point writes, like you know, random updates, now because the, the, the nodes are so wide, you have to load in the thousand keys and add your uh, own key, and then you have to write them all back. So you get this almost thousand X uh, write application at this, at this point. And, and so really they, they, they work really well when you can cache most things in memory, but once you run out of memory, they don't, they don't work so well anymore. <clears throat> Um, so um, at the time, I was I was talking a lot to a guy called Andy Twig, who was having had a startup called Akuno, uh, and uh, he was this kind of super smart uh, algorithms guy um, who knew about this new kind of class of algorithms, and I think back then we would call them fractal trees. Um, I think uh, nowadays people mostly call them LSMs. Uh, 
Uh, I think uh, back then, and if you look at the original LSM paper, it's actually a fairly simplistic data structure, but I think nowadays LSMs kind of encompass this whole family of kind of related data structures where some of them are, are really good. <clears throat> so, um, so we learned from them and we implemented this as kind of this uh, log structured uh, merge structure uh, or, uh, where you have, basically you have, uh, you split your data set over a number of levels. Each level is wider than the previous one by some uh, multiplication factor, like we, we choose, you know, somewhat arbitrarily uh, choose 16. And then uh, when you append, you basically just append to the first level that has space. And when you need to read something, uh, you, you maintain a B-tree for each of the levels uh, so that you can, you can find your, you know, quickly locate your data uh, to that offset in the level. Um, so you don't have to scan or anything, you just do a B-tree lookup now you, you look up in all the B trees un until you hit the level that has your data and then you re return that. <clears throat> and because this is kind of a, with log stru structuring and, so and all, it also makes it fairly simple to add compression because then it's not a problem to have uh, you know, variable size objects inside your store. And, and so the way we, we ended up doing this, uh, we actually split uh, the, the keys from the values so that we would have a B tree uh, per level and then we would ha have a log per, uh, per level so that we would, we would um, always merge the B trees eagerly. So the B trees would always, always be completely sorted uh, and then we would append uh, to, the, to the logs, to the level uh, until that fills up and then you merge into the next one. And then we did some other, uh, I think Mindcastle is kind of version four of this stuff. So we tried a lot of different things over the years uh, but we ended up with uh, with this design and also with uh, a thing that, that at least was novel at the time where we would merge uh, several levels in, in parallel when they filled up. Uh, and then we didn't actually use B trees, we use uh, B plus trees that are a variation where you have, uh, there's a difference between the, the inner nodes and, and the leaf nodes. Um, and a and, uh, final thing that, that's pretty cool is that we found that you can, uh, B trees, if you've ever tried writing a B tree, it's actually a fairly complex, uh, complex uh, data structure to work with. Uh, but if you have all your input data is already sorted, it's, it's actually quite trivial to generate a, a B tree uh, as you know, linearly, linearly from, the, from the sorted data. So that's what we do. So we don't ever insert anything to the B trees, we all just generate a, a, a brand new B tree. And we use the, the B trees to, to, to guide the, the merges and the compaction. Um, <clears throat> so after working on this for on and off for about five years, um, this is kind of where we got to uh, in terms of performance. So where we started was this uh, VHD format, and uh, so the, the benchmark here is, is something that I, I wrote to make myself look good. Um, it's, it's a tool called, called image test that you'll find in the Mindcastle source code. It basically just does, uh, it's mostly a correctness tester. It just does, you know, n random writes over some, some address space, and uh, then it'll, it'll you know, reseed the, the random generator to the, to the same seed, and then it'll do the the equivalent random reads, and then it will compare the results to see that it got this, the, the same data back. And that was a very you know, valuable tool over the years, and it also allowed us to keep sort of a track of how the performance was going. So anyway, as you can see, that we, we got a fairly good speed up, especially for, for random writes, that uh, even though this was an SSD, and you'd think, well, SSDs are pretty good at, ran at random writes, well, if you're, if you're trying to do them on top of something like VHD that actually needs to, to the demand allocate a lot of space, while it's doing the random writes, then, then it's, it's, it's not really going to be very fast. Uh, and also we were, uh, uh, probably due to compression, able to almost double the, the, the read uh, throughput as well. Um, but I think actually the most uh, important and useful thing for us was that we went from, from in this case, which is you know, the absolute worst case, we, we went from a fully allocated 16 gigabyte uh, footprint down to uh, 131 uh, megabytes for this case. So that suddenly makes it a lot more feasible to have 100 VMs uh, on your laptop at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so what happened next was that I, I um, kind of switched to doing AI and um, Bromium were kind enough to actually open source the, the we call it the swap uh, system because we were Imagine, uh, we thought initially that it would mostly be for swapping, so the VMs would be swapping on systems. So that's why it's called swap, and if you, if you look at the source code, you'll see there's a lot of symbols there called swap, and that's just, just the kind of confusing reason for that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so um, because Romeo open sourced this, uh, I decided to, uh, to spend some more time um, working on it, and I had some ideas for making it distributed. Uh, 
Um, so basically, we, we took the, the GPL release of the Bromium swap code, and um, first I ported it from, from Windows to Linux. Um, and then I, um, so, so I added uh, support for fetching chunks, so parts of this uh, dub tree from uh, over HTTP. And then uh, instead of just numbering the chump, uh, chunks, um, I changed uh, the naming scheme so that they would name, uh, be named uh, by the their hash of their contents. So you'd, you'd call that your content addressable storage. Um, and um, I, I added encryption everywhere. And so the, the whole thing, because of the, the hashing, uh, kind of uh, what it means is that, that uh, you, you get what's called a Merkle hash tree, where basically you can, you can get, uh, you can kind of look at the hash of the root, and if anything changes in, in, the, in the tree, then the, the, that will kind of trigger all the way up to the root, and the, the hash of the root will also change. So it's it's uh, that's why I say it's a bit like Git. It's a, like it's a bit like the Git change set ID being kind of the, the sum total of everything that's in the history of the, the tree. And um, it turns out you can do this uh, retaining you know most of the performance. Of course, there's some overhead for the the hashing and the encryption, and then that uh, makes it into a distributed system and and also quite secure because now you cannot tamper with any of the bits without either the the hashes changing or the um, uh, the, the crypto uh, functions kind of uh, figuring out for you. Um, <clears throat> so here's kind of a picture of, of, of the, how the, the, you know, the tree is organized. Uh, there's a root node, and the root node uh, in reality is just a little uh, text file that I'll show you with uh, the hash of uh, basically the first of the B tree, and then the B tree points into uh, some, uh, the first level that, that split into chunks. Uh, and the, the, the B tree is also a chunk, so the B tree has a hash. Uh, the parts of the, the chunks that are in the level have hashes, and then there's a, it's, the B tree is kind of form a linked list, so it points to the next B tree and the next B tree and so on. And that means that you have, you know, the, the, the hash of the root is, is kind of like the vertical hash of the old tree. <coughs> um, yeah, I think I said most of the stuff here. Um, so how do you actually make this you know, usable um, for, for your day-to-day -day workloads? Well, the first thing I added when I, I put it over from Windows was an uh, NBD uh, front end. So you guys probably know the, the network block device, which is a you know, fairly simple way to hook uh, blog IO in Linux. I also added a, a KVM tool front end. So KVM tool is this lightweight um, uh, virtualization alternative to, to Q, QMU, so you can run VMs. So now you can both, you can form it, this is a file system with something like XFS, or you can run a VM over it. Uh, and then there's, there's a layer here in the code where it, it does the, the compression of the in incoming data. There's, there's a buffer cache. And then there's finally this, the DOP tree, this is the LSM-like uh, data structure at the bottom. Um, and so the um, one thing that was never really important uh, in Bromium, because we were always going to planning to throw away these VMs when when the user cl uh, closes the window is that we didn't really care too much about uh, crash consistency. So the way, the way it works is that the DOP tree data structure is always consistent because you have all these hashes and it's all copy and write and so on. But uh, actually the, the, the stuff that happens in the buffer cache may arbitrarily reorder your IOs. So it's not, you know, if you crash at the wrong time, it, it's, it's not, you know, crash consistency is not guaranteed. In fact, you'll just lose any state that you have had since the last checkpoint. Uh, you could imagine adding something like a you know, write ahead log uh, to, to get the, the crash consistency sorted. Uh, so anyway, so if you're looking for something to, to run your production database on, this is probably not it yet. Um, finally, uh, there's also support from Python, so you can use this uh, dub tree data structure as, as a single key value store, which is also sometimes uh, useful. <coughs> So I, I, I promised to show you what the, the format of the, the root uh, node looks like. Uh, so this is basically, this is, this is everything you need to, to uniquely name a version of a block device somewhere uh, in the cloud or locally. So uh, there's a UUID, that's just because VMs traditionally like to have UUIDs for volumes. Then there's a size because you have to report that's a uh, size even though it's kind of nonsense in this world where everything's kind of infinite. Uh, then there is the key, that's the 260-bit uh, uh, um, AES key for encrypting uh, all the values in the tree, or everything in the tree, really. Uh, and then there's a snapshot ID, and that's the thing that changes all the time uh, when you, um, the snapshot and the snap hash, they're kind of related. And basically every time you change something in the tree, it'll, it'll get a new snapshot ID. Uh, 
And that snapshot ID is actually the name of some chunk, either in your file system or in S3 or wherever. Uh, so that's the first thing that you would need to fetch to, to mount this file system. And in this case, so you can add a number of these fallback statements. And so basically, this is where uh, the code will, will look for your chunks. Um, so if you don't tell it anything, it'll just default to swap data dash UUID. Uh, but if you give it fallbacks, then it can look either you know, elsewhere in your file system or uh, on, on a web server somewhere. Uh, so that means I could basically email this to one of you guys, and then you could, you could boot a VM uh, that I had made. Or I can, I can uh, start a uh, VM uh, on Amazon that has this as an argument, and then it will mount my VM uh, or my, my disk image with uh, all my training data. Um, or uh, I can push this out to all my smart cameras, and then they will boot to exactly this version. And uh, if, I, if I turn off power, then they will actually revert back to this version, which is, which is nice if it's a kind of a stateless device. Um, one thing that, that's currently not supported is, is actually pushing these data out to the cloud. So the way that I use it, I always kind of author locally. So I use something like Docker to create my, uh, my images. And then I use Rclone, which is an open source tool for basically syncing back to S3 or Google Storage, whatever I'm using. Um, so it should be fairly, well, it's, there is some work to add if you want to do like actually writing stuff uh, back out automatically, but it's, it's not impossible. It's just a matter of copying stuff over HTTP puts. puts. Yeah, that was the URL. Um, <clears throat> so one sort of interesting challenge that came up when we switched from using this just as a thing that runs uh, for your temporary VM, was it time? So, okay, uh, on your Windows laptop, um, and then running on the cloud. And that's, uh, if you imagine the situation where you have um, your, your, you want to work on this, like uh, I want to check out, I want to work on my big machine learning uh, data set that lives mostly in the cloud, make some small changes, then Minecast will actually let me mount it without you know, fetching uh, everything. It'll only demand fetch the, uh, the chunks of the disk uh, that I need. Uh, but because of this, you know, how the, the, the LSM tree works, sometimes you actually need to merge. And so that you could, there could be a situation where you kind of get to the point where you trigger a merge and you need to read in a lot of stuff from the cloud just to merge it and, and write it uh, back out. And, and this is made worse by uh, using a fixed size chunking scheme. Um, because uh, you can imagine if you're trying to insert uh, some, some, some values in, 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 a, in, a, in the kind of logical uh, list of chunks, um, and, and you, 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 well, basically just squeezing in one byte or in one block, and then uh, because if, if you're doing like a fixed size chunking scheme, that everything to the right of your data, that needs to get rechunked into uh, new chunks of the same size. And so that means you need to read that back in uh, and, and create the, the new chunks and, and write it back out. Um, and so I think uh, a, a neat solution to this problem is to use basically what's called the, the rsync algorithm, uh, where instead of doing the chunking uh, fixed size, you do the chunking uh, based on the contents uh, of your data. And in that way, you can, you can localize your, uh, your chunk merges, uh, and you don't have to uh, read and write so much data back to the cloud. Um, I know, I, I guess you guys all know rsync, but maybe you don't know that's how it works. But it's, it's, it's a pretty cool algorithm, and it's worth looking up. Um, <clears throat> so um, fortunately, I still have the same laptop that Bromium gave me when I, when I left them, so I was able to uh, kind of test the Minecast performance um, here many years or a couple of years later. Um, it's probably worth actually doing, looking at the, the bottommost one first. You can see that Minecast on Linux is not yet as fast as, it, as the Windows version was. Um, and, and part of that is probably because of the, the hashing and the compression, but also because the, uh, the Windows version was just better optimized. Uh, so I haven't done the, the you know, the, the full deep dive on getting this as fast as I can. Um, also, if you're kind of uh, worried about the impact of, uh, of the encryption, if you look at the, the, the table at, at the top, you can see that for the writes, there's actually virtually no impact. Uh, but for the reads, you get probably like a 50% overhead. And I think actually you also get that 50% overhead for the writes. It's just that the writes happen on a, on a background thread, so you don't really feel the pain as much. Um, so on, on a more modern system, on, uh, on a you know, 7th gen i7 with an M2 SS, Samsung SSD, uh, Minecastle with uh, and without encryption gets you know, these uh, IOPS. Uh, 
So it's, it's, even though it has all these features, it actually you know, has fairly respectable performance compared to like, you know, your local SSD. Um, so in terms of uh, future uh, work, I already talked about, a little bit about this uh, PyKV, which is a simple key value store uh, with a Python interface. Um, what we use, try using it for is actually because when you have a very large data set, uh, uh, there was a previous talk about that, the, the metadata overhead becomes fairly massive uh, and you don't want to do a, a find or a scan over it anyway. So, so it actually makes more sense to use something that's more like, more like a top file. The problem if you're doing machine learning is that you actually need to access all your elements in kind of random permuted order. Um, so what we find we could do with this stop tree data structure is that we, we can kind of pre-permute everything into the stop tree uh, data structure. And then we can, we can do a sequential scan when we're doing the training epoch. And then while we're doing that, we can, we can reinsert the values that we put out under a new permutation order. And so we, we have one permuted database, we scan that sequentially. And then we end up with another computer database that we scan sequentially. And with that, we can actually keep up with two GPUs doing stochastic uh, gradient descent with about 1,000 images per second uh, with a 70-year-old hard drive, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, another th couple of uh, things I'd like to pursue. Uh, one is to try and integrate a, a proper POSIX layer instead of just having it be a, a block device. Uh, the main motivation for that is that uh, when you're working with, with NBD, it's, it's kind of, everything is a little flaky. You can actually get into deadlocks and stuff where, where if you, you load your system, it's trying to, to kind of get everything evicted. And then therefore it needs to, to write to your file system. And then your file system says, well, I need a little, to do a few mallocs to write. And then it'll call on the kernel, but the kernel says, oh, but I need to evict some data. And then you get into a deadlock. Um, and I think if you were to add your own POSIX layer and you could, you could run this as a fuse model uh, module, you, you'd get over this problem. And then also I, I uh, hinted at the, the lack of crack, crash consistency, which is not something I need for, for my current use cases, but if you wanted to run like a database, whatever, you, you definitely need it. Um, that's it. Well, there's a summary, but we'll skip that. Thanks. <laughs>